this session going and hope that this does become uh, this does become a regular session at AAS. Okay, um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, a preprint that we have uh, on the archive now, uh, titled uh, "SETI with Spatiotemporal Surveys." And as one of the speakers earlier alluded to, uh, I think there's a great opportunity with some of the modern data sets that uh, Astronomy is producing for all kinds of other reasons uh, to do some really interesting SETI work. Um, and so uh, I've just sort of written this talk quickly with sort of four big takeaway points. Um, the first is that I think optical surveys, uh, like a couple mentioned here that are highly featured uh, at this meeting, we have an uh, open house tonight about TESS, I think there's one tonight or tomorrow about LSST as well. Uh, these surveys I think are primed to do uh, new kinds of SETI work that hasn't been uh, heavily studied before. Uh, and so my soapbox point, if you only take one point away from this talk, is that uh, we need more literature on possible uh, types of signals or ideas or things that we can search from. Um, another way of phrasing that is that there's a huge opportunity here. So if you are interested, if you're a student, if you have a data set like every scope, um, if you've got sort of a, a wild idea, these data sets are the perfect uh, sort of playground or sandbox to test some of these ideas out, um, to create algorithms that are portable, to use on multiple kinds of data sets. Uh, are extensible to new data sets, or even go back through archival data. So I think there's a huge opportunity here to develop new ideas uh, and to search over huge areas of the sky. LSST is going to search over effectively half the sky. Tests is searching over 80% of the sky. Um, the potential to look for new things over wide areas is already there. Um, point number two um, is that not only can these surveys do SETI and search over wide areas of the sky for long periods of time, they might actually even be good at it. Uh, if we can figure out how to do it. So, uh, as with almost all areas of astrophysics, supernovae, um, stellar variability, transiting exoplanets, things that are very popular these days, uh, surveys can dominate if we frame our science questions correctly. If we're just collecting things, if we're just going around collecting butterflies, then surveys maybe um, seem like kind of a waste of time. But if we frame our astrophysical questions, testing planet formation theories, testing uh, the lifetimes of stellar activity, things like that. If we can frame our questions to make use of the surveys in the right way, then surveys end up dominating, become often the most efficient way to do science, which is, why, of course, why we see a huge growth of surveys. And so I think that's the, the challenge for SETI. We need to start forming SETI questions that can make use of uh, the, the, the sort of cadence and the modeling uh, that comes out of these surveys. Um, Jason Wright and colleagues wrote a, a really nice paper uh, now two years ago um, about exploring needles in the n-dimensional haystack. I'm going to forget you're on stage. I think it was 11 dimensions, Jason? Nine, Nine dimensions. Okay. That's, that's still sufficient numbers of dimensions that I can't plot it on this screen. Um, but I can draw a nice little needle graphic here. Um, and the idea is that uh, we have some large dimensional parameter space that we're looking for, right? We have so few ideas about what we're trying to find in any SETI search. We're looking in huge dimensions of sensitivity and area, integration time, uh, cadence, polarization, things that are very specific, of course, to the radio. Uh, and I think that there is a very analogous argument to be made about uh, the dimensionality that we're looking in the optical. Now, we don't, in optical surveys like, uh, like LSST and TESS, we're not worried about polarization and modulation, but bandwidth is something, you know, the, the band pass we're looking through, the cadence, the distance of which we're sensitive to. So many analogous kinds of properties can be made. And so in this preprint that we did, um, or that I did with some friends, and I published uh, last year, um, we explored um, trying to move this very radio-focused n-dimensional haystack into the optical and showing that making some very simple assumptions about similar kinds of transmitters uh, and sorts of brightness that people might be able to detect. Um, optical surveys, so here is the sort of typical volume uh, that Jason and colleagues put into the, his paper about radio. Uh, the optical surveys, um, if we make some simple assumptions about the kinds of signals we might detect, perform, and this is a log haystack volume, perform one to two orders of magnitude better uh, than the radio surveys. This is because these surveys are looking like, things like every scope here. Uh, every scope actually beats LSST slightly, which I love, uh, considering how big LSST is and how small every scope is. Um, these surveys uh, really dominate in this volume, in this parameterization, because they're surveying massive amounts of sky repeatedly over many years. So of course that's not optical or optimal for many kinds of signals. Uh, but it is optimal for some signals that we might conceive of. Uh, to extend the analogy that they used in their paper, where we might be looking at, uh, I think optimistically they said it was like a hot tub as compared to the ocean or something, in terms of the volume ratio that the SETI surveys were, um, were, were sensitive to, 
uh, we might optimistically say that we're sur surveying a couple of swimming pools as compared to the, uh, to the volume of the ocean. That's not a huge volume, granted, um, but if we're trying to suss out the um, uh, life in the oceans with a swimming pool, it seems a lot more available than, than looking in a, a hot tub. It's like a be much better volume to search over. Okay. Point number three is that we do have, I'll call them trivial examples because they're things that we've already talked about a lot, um, even today, um, but there are some trivial examples that we can point to uh, for sorts of signals that we might look for. Uh, and so I just want to spend a couple minutes going through what I think are some easy examples, but these are hopefully, hopefully you will laugh at them and say these are too easy, I have a much better idea. So the hope is to incentivize you to go and run with this and, and, and create new literature. Um, now I want to, of course, highlight this uh, awesome summary figure um, they came out of the NASA Tech Research Workshop from uh, about a year and a half ago, um, where they talk about what are the sort of best kinds of sort of best kinds of signals. And these, the best kinds of signals are ones that a civilization would inevitably create. Um, I don't think that the optical SETI literature that I'm going to point to today necessarily fills this uh, inevitability criteria very well. It's sort of um, convoluted or. Uh, um, yeah, they're sort of like complex signals that we might uh, ask why a civilization would, would broadcast them, but we can search for them nonetheless. So, of course, as was just mentioned, things like Voyage and Star, fascinating object, astrophysically and or SETI op opportunities, big dips, uh, long-term decays, strange modulations from the ground. Um, these things, well, until we had better explanations, these things were somewhat unexplained and are eminently searchable from large data sets like the Kepler test data sets. Um, one project that I'm very excited about and I've seen uh, recently some more literature on is the BASCO project, the Vanishing and Appearing Sources Over a Century of Observations. So here's my cartoon version of this. This is looking at sources over decades or even a century time scale, uh, stars that would disappear or would very slowly fade with no other explanation. Um, I think this is a very promising technique. I think they've got one interesting object uh, referring back to a plate archive. Um, and Hopefully, with things like LSST coming online, we can set new upper limits on whether or not this star actually, their, their candidate star actually disappeared, or if it just had a state change. Thank you. Um, there's, of course, opportunities to look for things like Dyson spheres, which are good. Um, there was a, a very interesting op uh, object that was actually tweeted out a bunch uh, a couple weeks ago a rebroadcast or a light echo from Supernova 1987A, which I think is, again, astrophysically totally fascinating about the dust structure around. Uh, uh, 1987-8, uh, but these also could be potentially uh, SETI signals. You could imagine an intelligent civilization seeing a galactic scale event like a supernova and rebroadcasting it as a way of saying like, oh, we saw this, we're here. This would be an interesting uh, beacon structure. We don't think this is one of those that seems to be pretty close um, to uh, the LMC here, so I don't think this is a candidate here, but something like this is something that we could write down as an algorithm, stick into a computer and look for. There's an opportunity here. Um, I think um, uh, the laser cloaking technology idea that uh, David Keeping and Alex Tichy published a couple years ago is a great example of something that, again, we could, we could look for missing transits in a series of very regular transits from the mission like Kepler or TESS. If a transit just went missing one day, this would be an interesting um, potential source of study, uh, study trigger that we might look at. Um, and we might consider like even more uh, convoluted and complex uh, measurements where we like look for spatial clusters of things, things that multiple stars that are doing things in a coordinated manner that should not know about each other. So if it, many transiting planets, for example, that are transiting at the same time or that had the exact same radius and things like that. And so um, I, I worked through a couple of little examples like this in the, the preprint here. I won't spend any time on this, but. It's the kind of thing that you can postulate and very quickly run um, some very simple machine learning algorithms on. Uh, you can find candidates and then you can realize that those are not significant and throw them out. But it took two seconds to run. So we can run unlimited numbers of these kinds of tests through our data. Okay, and finally, future directions. Um, there's a ton of these surveys coming online and as they're building the infrastructure to look for supernova, to look for uh, transit exoplanets, we have the infrastructure to piggyback and do SETI, I'll say, for free, but I just mean we don't have to actually go to the telescope. We still need to pay people to do this. So um, it is free in the hardware sense, not in the people sense. Um, in the future, we might imagine looking for all kinds of new types of lighthouses. We can imagine other algorithms that might be good for, uh, uh, for finding new kinds of signals. Things like, uh, I've been speculating and uh, scratching my head about things that are repeating, but not periodic. There's a ton of effort going on right now in missions like ZTF and 
every scope and LSST and test to look for periodic signals because they're very easy to look for repeating periodic signals. But what about things that repeat with uh, a non-periodic sequence, like some sort of Fibonacci sequence or a numerical sequence? Um, we can use the same sorts of approaches we'd use to look for periodic um, repetition, uh, and we can look for Fibonacci repetition, for example. This is a, a cartoon example that it didn't work. Um, it works, but it's slow. There's algorithm opportunities here. Okay. And uh, here at 10 minutes, I will just put up again these four bullet points that I think optical surveys, infrared surveys, and all the other wavelengths that are going online uh, are a prime opportunity to develop new setting literature. They might even be good at it if we can learn how to do it. Um, there are some trivial examples in place, and I would encourage and I would welcome, so every scope people who are in the back and want to talk, I would welcome opportunities to talk about new kinds of signals that we might look for. Thank you.